Hi there, I'm your host, Clive Sirkin, and welcome to the Unstuck Podcast, where we're on a journey to help you get control of your work environment, get yourself unstuck, and perform to your full potential. Okay, so I got to tell you, it's exhausting just introducing my next guest. Um, keeping up with Chad Bronstein is is not for the week. Uh, over the next 30 minutes, Chad and I are going to cover what I would consider an extraordinary journey um, that Chad has been on and how this has driven a playbook, in, in my mind, the, the, uh, the ultimate playbook of not being stuck. So uh, big welcome to a friend of mine, a business associate of mine, and a good human, Chad Bronstein. Welcome, my friend. Thanks, Clive. I appreciate being on here and uh, I have the utmost respect for you as well. So thank you. Hey, man, it's all in it together. It was like, just by way of introduction, for those of you who don't know Chad, amongst other things, Chad is the founder and CEO of Philo, the co-founder and chairman of Tyson 2.0, the co-founder and executive chairman of Wisana, and he sits on a number of boards, advises a number of company and holds equity positions in a number of companies. And we'll, we'll cover that. But I think generally, Chad, I... I I got the gist of it, right? Yeah, you definitely did. You know, so slightly, let's just say slightly busy. Um, And I don't want to talk a lot about each of these ventures. I mean, obviously, we had Daniel on a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about Persona, but there's a lot to cover, you know, Tyson and and, and, and Philo and uh, Artists for Artists. But but before we get there, I want to talk about, like, how you got here. Um, You know, the best way I can describe your approach is like intelligent, bold hustle. Um, in a, it, that's actually, a, that's, a, that's a great, honestly, I like that. Intelligent, bold, intelligent, bold hustle. That's yeah. something I use. Yeah, it's, it, it, at least that's my observation when I'm around you and we're working together and doing that stuff. But when you see people, and, and it's it's sort of muscle memory. It's not like, you know, it's not like from the book. And so when people have muscle memory like that, my assumption, and I, and I know a little bit about your story, is that, that started a long time ago. It wasn't like you woke up one day and said you read a book and you're going to do that. So talk about the early days, you know, the car washing, the dog walking and all this stuff that over the years I've heard you talk about. Because I think it's important that people understand where this comes from and where the deep beliefs you have and the deep sort of behaviors that you've owned over the years. And, and plus, it's just fun to hear. Sure. So I started when I was younger, Clive, you asked the question of like, what got me started. I think I was born into me a little bit. I was, my parents always said I was a, a nag and I always nag for everything that I, I wanted to get. And a lot of times. By the way, nothing's changed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's what my dad, my dad would always say, you're going to be really successful because you're a big nag. Right. And so um, my mom and dad were both pretty, you know, uh, successful hustlers, you know, that old school mentality of just, um, you know, being aggressive and, uh, pursuing what you want. And um, I think for, for me, my, I was lucky because both my parents instilled a lot of belief in me and um, pushed me um, in different ways. And um, and so I think, you know, I, I, always, I was always trying to figure out ways to make money at a young age, like whether it was finding like an old Nintendo and going to figure out a way to flip it, or you mentioned Beanie Babies, you know, I saw that craze of that trend and I would pick up and uh, the newspaper on a Saturday and look at all the Beanie Babies that are for sale. And then I would take that as my prospecting tool and I call up all the stores to find those Beanie Babies that were selling for good money. And I would just literally call every store possible and find them at retail price. And then I'd go to Dairy Queen uh, with my mom would drop me off and stay there. And I'd meet these adults and I would sell <laughs> Beanie Babies. Um, classic. Yes. And I made thousands of dollars doing that. And, um, you know, I guess it was just, you know, I'm a competitive person and um, and I was always just trying to figure out, you know, ways to be successful and um, get what I want. And so um, I guess throughout my whole childhood, that's that's what I was doing. And then, you know, it led me into it led me into detailing um, cars and uh, other aspects. Hold on, Chuck Clive. Sorry. There you go. OK. Yeah. So. So, um, yeah. So. I, uh, then I, you know, I, my dad was big into always washing cars and my buddy was, was like, we should start a detailing car business. So we started detailing car business and, um, we ended up becoming, you know, very popular in this, in the city, we, in, in Cleveland, we just pick up cars and bring them back to detail. But, you know, all, like I said, I was always an entrepreneur, always working and, um, 
and then also like wrestling was a big part of my life and always, you know, with big discipline for me, um, going to all the camps and the work ethic and, you know, waking up in the mornings at five in the morning and doing a workout and then doing another workout after, uh, practice after school and then working out later on. Like it just taught me a lot of, about discipline and, um, pushing through, like you go, I go to camps and, uh, you know, uh, this called Jeff Jordan you go in there and you'd be in a, in a barn in the back and, uh, you, you know, you're sleeping yeah. on the mats and you just, you know, you're taught, you know, for, go through as hard as you can, even when the pain's there. And I think that that also correlates a lot with business. hundred percent. And the sticking power, by the way, you, you may from time to time hear another voice in this podcast and it's Chan's son who's with him now. And <clears throat> I might as well just talk about it now. Cause I was going to ask later on, you know, and it, you work like a dog. I mean, I see you, um, you know, day to day basis, and yet you dedicate a ton of time and prioritize your family. Um, and I think it's appropriate that that you you you're a little guy sitting there with you. How do you manage that? Because that you know that takes a lot of discipline. Obviously, you know, intellectually, it, it's a no brainer. Um, yeah, I think. It, I think COVID taught, and you put Clive, because you're the same way. Obviously, you've been a CMO and uh, C level at, you know, past what, 15 years of your career at big companies. Yeah. And I was in, cor- in corporate, but I think, you know, COVID taught us how to do that, I think, because, you know, we were always, before when you and I first met, like with Philo, like we were traveling everywhere, we had offices. And then when COVID hit, like you're working from home. And so right. you learn how to manage your time and, um, I think that was for me, it was the best thing that ever happened because I got to learn how to manage my time better and, you know, dedicate more time to my family. So I think um, prior to that, I was, you know, always just on the weekends, like always dedicating all my time, but now I get to spend more time during the week and um, I get to coach sports and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy, but uh, it's priority and you got to figure it out and you know, you do the same thing with your family. So um, it's it's interesting that you you bring out the COVID thing because I also think COVID has sort of changed expectations. Like, oh, it's it's not atypical for you to be on a call like this and for your son to be there or to be on a Zoom and there's a kid walking in and uh, which I think is one of the great things that happen as a consequence of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that now it's normal when your kids walk in because yeah, uh, it is uh, what it is. Know, Oh yeah, it is what it is, and every it happens to everybody. So you can't, you, everyone at this point just laughs because it's it's like it's the new norm. Right. So I think uh, I think that, and I think you know, I always I would say you would probably say it's about Kate, right, with your success. But like I think for me, my first part of my life, my success and stuff was driven by you know a lot of work ethic, but a lot of you know guidance from my fam, my mom and my dad, and stuff like that. And then when you you enter the next bright phase of your life and you get into a relationship, you know, like my wife drove me a lot too, to be successful because when I met her, I was a nobody with my clothes folded against my next to my mattress moving from my first job (laughs) in Chicago. Um, And so it's like you have two shepherds of your life, you know, and I think you would say the same about Kate as well. It's just like that, 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 you know, that's what drives me is my wife and my son drive me to be, you know, successful and allow me to be successful because, you know, when you're doing what you're doing, you have to have a good support system at home. And so okay. if you don't, it makes it a lot harder. It's a game changer. And, and you're right. It, it's how I've lived my life. But so you so you've lived this sort of hustle entrepreneurial thing. Then you go to college. You studied, if I remember you telling me sociology at Miami, but mostly, you know, you were doing wrestling. And then <clears throat> you come out the other side and you take I would say, corporate roles spending you know what seven eight years at at conian and and amobi why did you go and take a job versus trying to do a startup then was it part of a master plan or just the way it was and why Uh, and why the ad tech biz okay yeah so uh that's a good question so when i first was in miami ohio when i was in uh i was you know always athletic and i moved to trying to figure out ways to make money in college i got certified as a good pretty pretty sophisticated personal trainer like you have to go through stages and um i moved to chicago for a summer um my mom's um my mom was in the clothing business and her best friend had a, a clothing um showroom in chicago and he's like you can live with me so i i moved to chicago for the summer and i became a trainer at crunch for the summer and i became the number one trainer at crunch in sales and uh 
and I was doing very well. You know, you're making good money. And um, I met a guy that was in ad tech when I was there, and he's like, "You're amazing at sales. You should be, you know, working for uh, in the ad tech industry." And I'm like, "Interesting." And so I go back to college, and um, and in Miami, I won Entrepreneur of the Year at Miami actually. So I have done, and during college, I was actually doing other things as well. But uh, I uh, I went back to college and I got a call and he's like, you should interview for uh, IEC. And I did. And um, I actually left school a semester early because I they accepted the fact that I uh, I won after the year instead of a degree. And so I left college semester early and went to City Search as my first job. And I was 732% to goal there. Um, and I became the number one salesperson there. So just it just worked out that way. And I'm glad it did because um, you learn a lot through that process to then set you up um, as an entrepreneur. And uh, so, um, so yeah, so that's how I got to the ad tech side of things. Plus, you know, I always tell people when you start off in sales, I started off in sales. I was a costume jewelry salesman. That's for a whole other day. But you learn um, rejection and you also learn resilience. Um, and and I, I assume you had the same experience, which is, well, you, if you, and you also learn how to adjust because if you keep the same hustle, the same sale, the sales pitch, and it's not working, you're gonna die. Um, well, yeah, I got. I was so you listen like so when I got the job in C Search, it was selling local to like you're grinding selling to local like restaurants, right? You're going to the suburbs and selling to you know small businesses, and so then I wanted to go into the ad tech industry. I was young, I was 22 and a half or something, and no. And I left school and I was number one sales for City Search, but I didn't graduate. So I went to like 40 interviews and got rejected because of those, not because of probably the graduating side, but just because of my no experience in ad tech. Yeah. And then I finally landed a job at Bankrate. And I, you know, and, you know, like my work ethic always, I always became, you know, top, top person at the company and selling because I worked my ass off. And right. So then it led me into, you know, it's this company called Traffic Marketplace where I was, you know, the number one, I was one of the top salespeople there. Um, and then to add Conian, which, you know, I ended up becoming a director of sales at 24 there and then working my way to chief revenue officer because I grew the Chicago office there from myself to I think around a hundred person office doing hundred plus million in revenue. And then I ended up taking over the rest of the regions. Got it. And then, so it, 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 you know, an amazing experience over this. I, you know, I got to know Chad during that, that seven year period when he, when he was at a Moby and, and I was at Kellogg's and Kimberly Clark, but, um, during that, it's, it, and then you, I, I remember vividly the, the coffee we had back in, in the West Loop about three and a half, four years ago, it's almost four years. Um, and you talked about the vision for Philo. How did that happen? Why then? Like you, you've been on this incredible run. And you make a decision, I'm going to flip and I'm going to go and start something. High risk, totally different game. You know, there are some parallels in terms of, you know, a SaaS platform in the tech world, in the brand and marketing world. But what led you to that pivot and that transition? You know, that's a, good, that's a really good question. So when I was at the end, and I think you probably had the same feeling from not to insult Kellogg's or Moby, but I think of the sense of like being a corporate, like, for long, you were longer than me, but you know, eight years there. Um, the questions I had to ask at that time were like, I had I had a lot of offers to go run companies, quite a bit of them, and um, but it was not my company, right? It'd be chief revenue officer, or president of someone else's company, and that's not a bad thing. But I think I had enough of that, to be frank. And so it was a tough decision because I was used to making a lot of, you know, at corporate you make good money, so I was used to making that. I'm like, look at my wife at the dinner table. And this is back to what I was saying about like, I wouldn't have done this without her support. And I said, I'm going to go start this. I want to start a company in cannabis. And she's laughed at me because <laughs> uh, I don't really, I didn't before this, I didn't really smoke much weed or ever really talk much about marijuana. Right. Yeah. So uh, she's like, you should do that. And you should go start something yourself. And so with that support, I did that, but I wouldn't have done that probably because it was, it was scary. Right. I was 14 years outside of the eight at Moby been making great money. And, you know, in that world. And I did have a startup company. I got to start in Moby that I raised some money for called Worthy, which was a dog, do, uh, real-time dog walking company. Um, so that allowed me to be not, Kim, Kim Farrell allowed me to be an entrepreneur in that sense. She invested in it. And I got to, I partnered with another Chicago entrepreneur. But 
I would say if I didn't have that sign of sigh of relief and support from Selena at that time, I wouldn't have done it. But it was the best thing I've ever done. That's what I was meant to. I'm meant to be doing what I'm doing now. And um, then, you know, I think when you're when you're when you're coaching someone else's company at the time, you can't really make all the decisions. And I, I'm not saying I make all the decisions at Philo, but I like to have the ability to allow people to make decisions and take risks that I think are feasible to be successful, whether they fail or not, it's still a much better position for me. 100%. And, and just to your, you, 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 you made a point and then you sort of caveat, which is like no disrespect to Kellogg's or, or Moby and that. I, I feel the same way. It's like I, I was so ready to make the change, um, but I have no remorse because I always just go, what I'm doing now is radically different to what I did when I was corporate at Kellogg's and Kimberly Clark, but I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing had I not gone through the, that journey. So it's like, for me, it's like they're not incongruent. It's one led to the other, and I'm deeply grateful for it, but I was ready to go. I was ready to well, you could have, Yeah, you probably could have done it 10, 15 years earlier, right? But you yep. got you could agree, and I got the same way, is that you, got, you get complacent and comfortable in those environments, um, and you still work your ass off because you and me are the kind of people like we just, you know, I traveled four days a week. Let's be clear. Like there was no time that that's also made my life, you know, the last two years of it, I was miserable because I was traveling four days a week and people like, Oh, you get to travel. Like you and I both can say, it's like, it's not that great when you're, uh, when you're away from your family and you're, yep. you're staying in hotels, uh, it gets lonely. But anyways, I think you and me ha and you're, you know, you're, you technically retired and you're out of retirement and you're helping companies like me and other companies, but you know, you have to have an energy level that is pretty high. And I would say, we're talking about me, but to you is like people that are listening, like you're very helpful to companies like mine. And you also, I think the fact that you did the Kellogg's, Kimberly Clark, now, like you said, or me doing what I've done, it gave us credibility to actually go and be wanting to help companies. Oh. Well, and my, my, thank you for that. And then my perspective is like, I only have two switches, all in or all off. Like you can't, and particularly when you, you have an, when you say yes to help someone, you're making a commitment and a contract with them and the stakes are high for that person. Like if, if you don't succeed, you're fine. But I'm, my perspective is when you say to someone, hey, I'm going to come, I'm going to roll up sleeves and come help you, you, you're now part of owning their vision. And and I remember you, we had that, it was Beatrix, if I remember correctly, we were sitting there having that coffee. Yep. And, and the, the, prem, the way I, I recall the conversation was like, cannabis is... Um, is going to be an explosive growth category. You know, it's going to go through the troughs and valleys and, you know, and all the, you know, legislation and when when Congress moves and doesn't move and all that stuff. But, but ultimately, it's a hyper-locally regulated um, category. And that pre presents both a problem and therefore an opportunity, which is the companies who are playing in the space never know exactly whether they're compliant or not. And your your idea was um, let's scrape all the regs at a local municipality level, automate it, and do two things. One, um, give in-house counsel or external counsel uh, accurate, timely access to the regs. Um, and the second thing is give the businesses the opportunity to know that their marketing, their packaging is compliant and therefore be able to actually place advertising with the publishers knowing that the, the compliance risk is removed. And I, I remember that conversation and I don't know if, if, if it, how accurate it is, but that's my recollection of it. I'm like, holy shit. And, and, and I remember talk, you talk going, we're scraping every reg. It's not just cannabis. We're going to focus on cannabis but we're pulling all the regs on anything that's hyper locally regulated. Is that, did I, did I, is my memory good? Yeah, I would say, yeah, that's when we were acquiring cataracts, right? Right, and then right. We were, and then we we're going to rebuild it. But yeah, that's exactly what it was. When we started this, like you asked what what started it. It was like, I just started learning a lot about cannabis because at Moby, you get a lot of hit ups from like at the time when like it was early days with Charles Webbs or those other guys who were big, right? And uh, they couldn't run advertising. We wouldn't run their advertising. And so that's kind of what it's like, oh, shit, there's an opportunity here. And so that's when we jumped in. And then we realized, wow, we, we really got to have a compliance aspect to it. And that's when we hit up Amanda and decided to purchase Canaregs. And then 
you know, we had to rebuild the technology, but it had a really good um, platform at that point. And then we added that natural language processing to, to really crawl um, at scale and be able to collect all that data to, to then allow law firms to utilize it. But it also gave us the credibility to be able to go to publishers or, um, or brands because we have a large legal team that focuses on this. So, like, you know, it, made, it gives comfort in a space that is, um, you know, a lot of gray space. Absolutely. And then, so now we fast forward, you know, nearly four years <clears throat> and it's, it is that, that vision and so much more. Talk about the journey <clears throat> and how Philo evolved and why it evolved and what it is today. Um, because it's an incredible story of how to um, understand and read the market opportunities and evolve and aggressively build and grow to satisfy what's sitting, what's sitting in front of you. Well, I always use like an analogy, like, you know, when we have, we always sports, right? When I have McVeigh come speak to Philo, it's like, you're, you're, you're running, you got to make plays, right? And you got to make them fast. And you start to see like where you're weak or where you can do better. And that's, that's how we've established the ability to go out and purchase the companies we thought they were needed because we learned. And I think, you know, I was talking to a venture fund and someone, something that resonated with me is like, I invest in all these companies. Um, and people think I'm a genius when, a, when a, I find a really good CEO and they pivot five times or him or her pivots five times and they build this great company. I think that when you're, when you're running your own company and you've seen this Clive is like, you really got to be able to pivot and make quick decisions and find things that are going to creatively grow you. And so it's, we've, we've had the same vision, which was always to develop the largest data. When we started, this was to find the unique data assets about Clive Serkin. Clive was the same old Kellogg's, but you would never know Clive likes to eat edibles. And I always thought that was funny, but also it's like, it's a, it's a touch point that changes your whole demeanor and the way people see you in a, a positive way, because there's a lot of other aspects we probably don't know about you. And I think when you would go to Kellogg's and talk to you back in the day, you would say, I want to know something new about my consumer because I'm sick of targeting the same person that buys um, Special K or Kashi because I know that that person, what that person is. And I think that's, that's always stay the same. And that we've been able to actually um, build that. And we wouldn't have been able to build that without the team around me. I think that's what makes me successful is like, I pride myself in being able to find people like you or other people on the board, as well as my C-level team and the Philo people that we have great talent that allows us to move as fast as we have. And, you know, fast forward, it's actually been three years and four months to be exact. We're 300 people now. We're on our way to close our fourth acquisition. And we're at offices in Israel, um, Germany, Porto, uh, Armenia, Chicago, New York, California, and Denver. Um, and, and so we've, we've definitely grown pretty rapidly and it's just, I would say it's about being a risk taker. Like, I think you got to really be able to be, make big, big, big risks, even if you fail, because you learn a lot from them. And I think that's, that's what's made me successful is I'm, I'm able to recruit amazing talent, um, that helps support it, the, the mission, as well as um, taking big risks. And there's two there's two parts. There. One is the risk part, and one is the people part. Let's talk about the risk for a second. For me, it's like a I, 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 slight tweak to what you say. I'd say you're making big, aggressive moves and you're de-risking them. Um, yep. which is, because it's like when people say I would take a risky move, it's like saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a Hail Mary and hope it, they catch it. It's like, actually, no. I'm going to take a bold decision. I'm going to do what it takes to make sure that the chances of it failing are massively diminished. Yeah. I mean, you like, you know, I also, you, yeah, I would say bold moves. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you know, one thing I could say about Philo is like it, it you know, I jumped into be, be running, building Philo on my team is in a very weird times, right? right? I'm in this office where I'm at right now where I found out we've, you know, Clive, we were at dinner with COVID actually in March. And we're like, what is this? Like, and then we were in Benzinga. We had Benzinga and then the board meeting. And that was the last time I saw you for a while, right? Because we're like, then we were stuck in your office. And like, that was, that was COVID. Then you had all these other aspects, the lands, political landscape. And then you have, now we have obviously the, the markets and in cannabis markets are always up and down. So like, 
what I would tell, what I always tell CEOs and founders, being bold and also being bulletproof. And that, when I say bulletproof, I mean like, you can't let the bullshit, the negativity and all that other stuff get in your head. Cause if you do, you will fail. And so like part of what we talk about at Philo is like radical optimism. And that's how I've been successful. Like no matter what it is, I have that, like, you know, those goggles on that's great that I'm trying to always be optimistic and I don't let, and I, I, I'm bulletproof in the sense that I won't let anything affect me and I'll continue to build and grow, um, with positive vibes. Cause if you have negative, you're, you're, uh, you aren't going to succeed, especially in environments that we're in today. Absolutely. And the, on the talent piece, because you're very, very open about this. It's like, and I know, obviously, I know the team. You've got an incredible leadership team at Philo. And, um, but the thing you pretty constant about is this talent obsession, this relationship obsession, this loyalty obsession. And it's I've heard you use the term people first. Um, because it's one thing to have a vision. It's one thing to have the commitment and the resilience and the drive and all. This. But if you're not, you can't do it on your own. Um, and that's I know that's a big yes. deal in terms of how you think and operate. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, I, I built, you know, when we built Feel, I brought in two co-founders, Aristotle and Eric with me, which were, um, and they were the two first, you know, people I brought out as co-founders. And then I had other people that started really shortly thereafter, like Conrad and Nicole and um, many others that started. Jeff Ragavan, who's um, started like two and a half years ago into the company. And um, I would say that, you know, it for me, you know, it's people, it's people first, but also have to find people that fit your mentality, right? Because you can, all, you, and I think that's every company it should be people first, but it should be you know, people that you can find that fit your, you know, it's just like when you're getting married, you got to have chemistry with the people around you. And I think that, uh, um, when I started Philo and, you know, being a part of a Moby for eight years, like when we had at Coney and we had such an amazing team. And then, you know, when you're making these acquisitions that are stuff, things change, stigmas change, culture change. And so I was very selfish when I started Philo in the sense of, I want to develop a culture that I liked and that, um, I didn't want to have like an ivory tower approach. And I think when you're not, when you run a company like an ivory tower approach, then, then you're really not a people first company because you really don't know the people. And so I think at least it feel like what our C-level team does and in Tyson 2.0 and with Wisana, like we, the people are ingrained in the mission and the people below that can see that. And I think that if you treat, I've always been taught to treat um, the janitor, the same way you treat the C level, the person that runs the show. And I feel like if you have that mentality and you, um, you're not too big for your graces in the sense that you'll do anything to make something successful, then people see that they can respect that. And they can get down with the mission. I think that when they see the other side of it, then they're like, Oh shit. Like this person's not really saying what they, what they're, they're not, they're not practicing what they preach. And so I think that finding great people that fit your mentality and your, and, um, and that are along for the mission is um, that can follow like that have the same speed. Uh, Conrad always says like that high metabolic rate and like all the people around me, Conrad, Jeff, Aristotle, Nicole, Eric, uh, Wes, Mamta, Travis, uh, Kendall, etc. I'm probably dropping people's names um, that I forget, but anyone that's around me. And then, you know, Tyson, we have Adam as the CEO and Daniel as we sauna. We all have that, you know, that inherent mentality to hustle. And I think that what I was saying is that it's okay for people at your company to be transparent people that maybe don't have that same mentality. Maybe they're not right for the mission. And so one thing that I have Sean McVeigh speak about, and he speaks on his own about it, but he's radically candid with people. He tells them like, you know, if you can follow their culture and, you know, fit their mold in the right way and you're there for the mission and you bring solutions to the problem, you're just not there complaining about the problem. You actually have a solution to it. I think for me, that's important as how we run our company is like find the people that know what they signed up for and that love what they signed up for. And, and I think that being radically candid is very important in building a good culture. Yeah. And, and just for those who are, who are, who are listening, um, you brought up uh, uh, McVeigh a couple of times. You were college roommates with him and we talk about the NFL Super Bowl winning coach. Um, I remember one thing he said, which I, I, and I hope I don't butcher, it, but I, it, it struck a chord with me. He had a line, which was like, Do, does your behavior today um, line up with your picture of your success in the future? 
And I know it's not exactly verbatim, but it's like uh, that one. I walked away with a lot because when he talked to us, but that one struck me, which is like people have pictures and views of the future and these dreams and, you know, bold sort of plans for things. But if you don't, if your behavior today doesn't line up with that picture, you're not going to get there. Uh, in- yeah, and you, and and then also you got to be willing to make change to get there too, and not be afraid of change. So I think yeah, yeah, I think you know when I when you, when we started Philo, it's like and all these other things like you never pred- you can never predict where it goes. You can have a mission of how you're going to get there, and I think that um, it comes down to work ethic and creativity, and um, again having the right people around you. But I think that you got to set that mission and just stay focused on the end goal, but how you get to that end goal may be different than the way you thought it when you started it. Right. When, and, and to that point, it's like, that's one of the, um, the sort of hallmarks of great um, professional athletes, particularly like, say, let's, for example, a quarterback is when you make a bad play, you can either let it get in your, get in your own head and get caught up in the bad play where you go, I made a bad play, I understood what I did wrong, and I'm, I'm moving on to the next play. And in, in in a lot of times I see companies, whether it's startups or big companies or teams and individuals, they let a bad play on the, because you can take hits along the way and you've got to be able to move and adjust. And if you get caught up in taking the hit and why you took a hit versus understanding and moving on and getting rid of it, you're never going to move forward. Uh, and I know I see that in terms of the, just in the terms of the philo journey, it's the ability to see where the opportunities are on, Take the feedback seen, and move on, right? Yeah, Kai, have you seen the hits early on that we can't really talk about, but you saw some hits I went through like that could have been, you know, that's what I always say. It's like people see the press and they're like, oh my God, you're killing it. And there are times where you are, but it's like, also it's like, they don't, um, yeah. you, are, you, you are killing it, but you also don't see all the shit you deal with behind the scenes. And um, if, if, if that's why I said bulletproof, because you've seen, you've been there since day one with me, like literally since the beginning. So you've seen the stuff I went through and the things that, you you know, that you can't expect when you're, and I just feel like, you know, it's, um, it's really, it's it, like a quarterback or anything. It's like, you're going to make bad decisions and it's how fast you react to those decisions. I mean, how fast you react to make changes to those decisions. And it's like watching film. Like you watch a lot of film in your head. You can watch film on TV, but in business, you can't really watch it on TV. You just watch it what you've, you fucked up in your head all the, all day. And that's, and that's what I do a lot. I always am constantly thinking about like, what could I have done differently? How, and, and how do I make changes? And that, I think that's the key to being a successful entrepreneur. hundred percent. Hey, we're getting close to time, but we can't, um, we can't finish this without talking about Mike, talking about Tyson 2.0, um, for yeah. all of all the obvious reasons, because he's an incredibly interesting guy and in this, this journey that you're on, um, with Tyson 2.0 is phenomenal. How did, how did you meet him and, and how did this happen? Yeah. So I met him through, uh, so Daniel and I were sitting in this office one day. And I'm like, we got to get to Mike Tyson. And, uh, because, you know, we just had, we were at Patel event and talking about like, you know, psychedelics and cannabis and, um, and, you know, in order to be successful in these spaces, you really got to have people that, um, have suffered from something that can speak about it authentically. And then also give us that vocal, strength because of mike tyson's persona and who he is and his ability to reach people we're like we got to get mike and so i had a guy working for me um that i knew could get to him and he got he got to him and then i talked to his um his uh brother-in-law azim and his wife kiki and um told him we were doing it with sana and then we got him on board as a strategic advisor and then from there they asked me to look at some stuff that they were doing in cannabis and um you know, I'm not going to go into detail, but Tyson Ranch, you know, had his things. And um, I was like, I, I'm not, you know, you guys have that. I'm going to start something else. And I want to start something called Tyson 2.0. And if you guys want to do this, um, I, I believe we can do something really great here. And so um, we, we did do that. And then we brought in Adam as a CEO, Adam Wilkes, who has a lot of experience in cannabis and um, Aristotle, who uh, Clive knows, you know, very well. I brought him with me um, to, you know, do some of the stuff on the back end. And, um, we, we get, we met a lot of great people through that. Um, Kirk Tovey, who, uh, was one of their lead investors. The last one came in and, and we, we went and strategically aligned ourselves with Columbia care, but, um, it's been a great ride. You know, we, we become one of the most successful brands in the space. Um, and, uh, you know, I, Mike is amazing. Like 
one thing I would say is like why celebrity brands, a lot of them don't succeed is because a lot, just like we're talking about um, with work ethic and everything else, like uh, you think you're a celebrity and you could just launch a brand and just, that's it. It doesn't work that way. What Mike does that's very amazing, that's amazing for the brand is Mike travels everywhere and people see him constantly in dispensaries supporting his brand. And he's also very authentic. You know, Mike suffered, uh, he speaks openly about it. Um, and he, and he fixed himself with both, uh, psychedelics as well as cannabis. And that's his day to day routine. And so when Mike talks about marijuana and, and our product is premium and it does very well, it's because Mike knows his shit in the space and, um, and he's very smart and he's, um, and he's, uh, methodical and he, and he loves it. Like this, his favorite thing is Tyson 2.0, you know? So it's, yep. it's been great working with him, his wife, Azim, and then our team at Tyson 2.0 with Adam, we just hired amazing CMO that came from um, Anheuser-Busch, you know, Aristotle's part of the team. And, um, you know, you were an investor, Jeff's an investor. I think that's, a, that's a, the moral of the story here. It's like, we started with Philo and then we started these other companies, but you, Jeff, you know, Adrian, Jason, all the people that we've gotten to meet, Mitch, et cetera, they've all supported our other missions. Um, and so it's become a family of companies that, uh, with the same people in a sense. Well, well it's easy. It's like the, the, the formula is pretty straightforward. You bet on people. But to my, to your point, Mike, what was struck me about Mike is your point is how hard the, the man works. I mean, he grinds it out. It's not like, yeah, you can use my name and uh, send me a check. He's out there grinding it out and then incredibly thoughtful um, and, and, and unassuming. I remember sitting at dinner in, at, at Vegas at the, at the conference and, um, you know, Tom Tim is just a very thoughtful, very circumspect guy who's, who's fa- you know, had a look in the mirror and face up to some of the tough challenges he's had. And yet he's very at peace with himself. Um, it was yeah, quite fascinating because you, you have the stereotype, you know, bullshit that you hear and then you meet the person in, 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 in the flesh and then you see him in working. Like, you know, he's in, he's on the road, as you say. Yeah, he's. He's on the road and yeah, like I say, he's very humble. Um, and you know, he, the thing with Mike that is like, Mike's always around. Like, I think a lot of the big, like big names you don't see all the time. Right. Mike's probably the most popular guy in the world. One of the most popular guys in the world. And, uh, and he's always talking to his fans and always taking pictures. He never says no when someone stops him and he's out there. And I think it makes it more tangible and real of, because of he's out there and people get to like know who this person is. And I think, um, you know, he's very, he's a, he's a very, he's a very calm actually individual and, um, it's been fun working with them. And then we got, we just launched Rick Flair's brand too, who's also, you got to meet Clyde. I think you met him. I don't know. No, if you met I, him, but I know Rick There's a long story for another day. No, but I haven't met him this time around. I met him yeah. because I grew up with a, a friend of mine who was a professional wrestler. So I met Rick yeah. maybe 33 years ago when he was coming up. Um, he's also like, like in the sense that he's, everyone loves him and knows him. And he's also always out there hustling and talking to people. But I think that's, you know, that's, that's the key of building what we're doing at Tyson 2.0. It's building nostalgic moments. And in cannabis, like the reason why they do very well is Chase, my son knows who Ric Flair and Mike Tyson is. And your parents, Clive, or your parents, parents, and mine, same, we all know who Mike Tyson is, right? And Rick are. So it's like, you know, they, they touch upon all these generations and there's memories with those gener- around that. And I think that's also why they do very well because they mean something to some people. That that end to your early point, authentic for the good, bad, and ugly. Yeah. It they are who they are. Um, yep, they're not and, trying to be anyone else. Exactly, no, and that's crucial. All right, man. Well, we're we're at time. There's so much more we didn't cover. We're going to have to get back again because I do want to talk at a later stage about um, artists for artists and the, and the the idea, the business that you formed with Keenan, um, but. Um, Got to tell you, as always, it's enjoyed talking to you. I think there's a ton that the people who are listening and I take away from this in terms of what it takes to go from an idea to an actual business that's that's flourishing and to stay in the game and keep evolving. And so um, I appreciate you making the time. I know you've got a ton going on, my friend. So thank you very much. Any, anything for you, Clive. And thank you for all that you do for um, all of your companies you help out because you truly are – someone that says what they do and so i got nothing but love for you and i'll anytime any anywhere so thank you (laughs) thanks pal appreciate it man take care okay bye 
podcast was brought to you by Screen Dragon. We break down barriers, make workflow, and unlock talent. Visit ScreenDragon.com to see our software in action.